I'm Paul Levinson, and welcome to Light On, Light Through, episode 121, a review of The Crown, all three seasons. Well, my wife and I saw the third season of The Crown on Netflix over the last couple of evenings. We loved it. And I realized that I hadn't done any podcast reviews on Light On, Light Through of any of the preceding seasons of The Crown. And there were two. And that means there actually are a total of three seasons that I haven't reviewed of The Crown on Light On, Light Through. So here goes, and I just want to make clear that, as you'll hear, the reviews of the first and the second season were done uh, shortly after they aired and shortly after I saw them on Netflix. So to begin with, I thought the first season of The Crown was peerless. We binge-watched it on Netflix. Uh, The date of my written review is November 23, 2016. And I noted that it was especially welcome, entertaining, instructive, and appealing to see the crown in view of uh, what was going on in the current political news in the United States just a few years ago. The protagonist in this riveting 20th century docudrama is, of course, Queen Elizabeth II, very well played by Claire Foy. But I found the Winston Churchill story, a portrait of his final years as prime minister after being ousted by the British electorate at the end of World War II as reward for his heroic service as prime minister and saving the nation during that war. I found that part of the crown to be a mini masterpiece of politics and political philosophy in itself. Indeed, speaking of portraits, my favorite episode was the penultimate episode, the next-to-last episode of the first season, and the story it told of Graeme Sutherland's painting of Winston Churchill in 1954, which Churchill despised. In this hour, we get a disquisition on the nature of art and the process of the painter and the subject, made especially compelling, not only because the subject was Winston Churchill, but because he was a painter himself, at least by hobby. And John Lithgow, I have to say, just gave a tour de force performance of Churchill in that episode. And in fact, whenever he appeared on the screen, any time in that first season, Other than Churchill, my favorite character in the series, as of the first season, is a tie between Elizabeth and King Edward David, who, as we all know, in 1936, abdicated to be with, quote, the woman I love, unquote, Wallace Simpson, a divorcee, which resulted in Elizabeth's father becoming king and eventually Elizabeth becoming queen. Elizabeth and Edward are both bound by the monumental struggle about how to be a complete human being and wear the crown at the same time. In a peak conversation, Edward tells Elizabeth, who is rent by a dilemma about whether to support her sister Margaret's intention to marry Peter Townsend, another divorcee, Edward tells Elizabeth that even in abdication, Edward still feels himself to be two people, the person and the king, and he misses being the king every day. History repeats itself. Edward and Margaret both want to marry divorcees, and Elizabeth is left in different ways to pick up the pieces both times. It's easy for us in the 21st century, with Elizabeth still queen, to congratulate ourselves on our moral superiority, which doesn't frown on divorce anymore, let alone it being so unacceptable to the royal family. That is progress, for sure. But you know what? 
when I think about who will soon be president of the United States, <laughs> Donald Trump, and I compare him not to Churchill, but the worst politician depicted in the crown, well, that doesn't seem like progress at all, does it? So see the crown for an at turns fascinating, at turns heartbreaking narrative, not only of how far we've come, but how far we've fallen. And I review the second season on December 17th, 2017, and I gave it a standing ovation. The Crown Season 2 on Netflix, I said, exceeded Season 1, which was excellent on all levels. Which is to say the second season is a 10-episode tour de force with stories ranging from flashbacks in 1934 Nazi Germany, where Philip lived as a boy to JFK and Jackie in Buckingham Palace. Each episode was a gem, and most revolved around Elizabeth and Philip, but the final three was something else. Extraordinary indeed. The eighth episode was about JFK and Jackie. We're introduced to, I guess, what could be called the British perspective on America's Camelot, because I have no idea to what extent what is portrayed here in The Crown is true. In an earlier episode, we see the abdicated King Edward said to have hobnobbed with Hitler, with real photos of Edward and the Fuhrer. But no such proof is presented for Jackie and JFK. Both are portrayed as a little different from what we in the United States usually think of them. JFK is jealous of Jackie and nearly manhandles her as he expresses his displeasure to her about being the, quote, man who accompanied Jacqueline Kennedy to Paris, unquote. The way that played here in the United States was it was charming, not at all aggressive. And Jackie, for her part in The Crown, is portrayed as at times more rude, more vulnerable than we might have thought. But the impact of JFK's assassination on Elizabeth is something which we, the public, had no knowledge of before. We've seen the assassination and its impact on the screen many, many times. But The Crown manages to present it in a different, equally intense, and deeply moving light. The ninth episode is all about Prince Charles and his father, Prince Philip, played by Matt Smith, who deserves an Emmy for this performance, as does Claire Foy as Elizabeth, by the way. But in a single hour, Philip's and Charles's personas are explained, again in a way we haven't seen before. If The Crown were a Shakespearean tragedy, this episode amply shows that both Philip and Elizabeth were both central protagonists, Philip in this one especially, Elizabeth in all the other episodes. And the final episode about the Perfumo scandal, culminating in a renewal of Elizabeth and Philip's relationship, was a masterpiece again in itself. Philip is caught up in the scandal because he knew Dr. Ward. Philip was treated by him. And Elizabeth has reason to think that Ward found all kinds of ways to relieve Philip's, quote, tensions, unquote. Earlier, Elizabeth has some of the best lines in the series when she softly lashes out at Harold Macmillan, her prime minister, who is resigning mostly because Perfumo, Macmillan's secretary of war, who was implicated in the call girl ring, which involved a Soviet spy, no less. Hey, some things never change. That was all an embarrassment poor Macmillan couldn't overcome. Elizabeth notes that in the extent of her reign, at this point some 10 years, three prime ministers have seen fit to jump ship. They constitute, quote, a confederacy of quitters, unquote, she tells Macmillan. This, of course, is unfair to everyone except Macmillan. Both Churchill and Eden were forced out by their party, but it's a great line from Elizabeth anyway. 
Left Bank Pictures and Sony Pictures Television are already at work on a new season with new people in the roles of Elizabeth and Philip as befits their older ages. A standing ovation indeed for Foy and Smith and everyone involved in these first two seasons. And I posted my third review, my written review, just a few days ago on November 29th, 2019. I thought it was an outstanding story again with highly worthy chapters. And The Crown indeed is now back on Netflix with a third season and almost a completely new cast with Olivia Colman as Elizabeth, Tobias Menzies as Philip, etc. I like the cast and the episodes even more than I did the first two seasons. And as you just heard, that's saying a lot because I love the first two seasons. Among my favorite storylines as episodes in this third season... Prince Charles, now very well played by Josh O'Connor, had at least two episodes devoted to his growing up into full adulthood. One finds him in Wales, learning the Welsh language. The other has him back in England, falling in love with Camilla Shand. In both cases, we find Prince Charles to be more thoughtful, almost philosophic and tender than we might have thought. And the second episode shows Elizabeth at first not against Charles marrying Camilla. It's only when Elizabeth learns that Camilla's other boyfriend, Parker Bowles, also slept with Princess Anne, Charles's brother, that Elizabeth joins the rest of her family in opposing the marriage. All in all, very sensitively portrayed. And speaking of philosophy, there's an outstanding episode portraying Philip's reaction to the Americans landing on the moon back in 1969. This event is expertly woven into Philip's midlife crisis, more specifically into Philip's need to find some greater meaning in life. His idea that the astronauts, having been off this planet, may have experienced some greater meaning and the astronauts could convey it to Philip, makes perfect sense. It just so happens that that was the motive for my own anthology, Touching the Face of the Cosmos. You can look for it on Amazon. But it also made a different kind of sense that Philip, disappointed with what the astronauts told him, found a spiritual satisfaction of sorts right here on Earth. The literally political stuff, because as I think Mr. Wilson said at some point, everything is political, but the literally political stuff in this third season of The Crown, with Elizabeth adopting to and hurting changes in prime ministers from Churchill to Wilson to Heath to Wilson. That was excellent. But where were the Beatles? And their, uh oh, Mr. Wilson, uh uh, Mr. Heath. Yeah, seriously, I mean, you know, the Beatles were huge in this period of time, and I was just wondering why we didn't hear. Uh, a word about them, or even a note of their music in this third season of The Crown. By the way, Margaret, played now to the saucy hilt by Helena Bonham Carter in two episodes, one bonding with the coarse Lyndon Johnson, the other trying to divest herself of her philandering husband, was also top draw. And, just for good measure, let me throw in what a good job Charles Dance did as Mountbatten, first almost pulling off a coup, next steering Charles away from his true love. So, The Crown Season 3 was outstanding in all kinds of ways, moving Elizabeth's story along. Oh, I I forgot to say how effectively she was portrayed in the Welsh mining disaster, finding her tears and heart at long last. And The Crown Season 3 was also very effective in telling individual stories 
about love, philosophy, and politics that were effective and memorable all on their own. I heartily recommend it. The Light on Light Through podcast. Well, I hope you enjoyed this review of all three seasons of The Crown. I'll be back soon, either with another review or talking about something else. In the meantime, enjoy. Athens, 2042 AD. She ripped the paper in half, then ripped the halves, then ripped what was left again into bits and pieces of history that could have been. Sierra Waters had read once that, years ago, it was thought that men made love for the thrill, while women made love for the sense of connection it gave them. Curled up with a good book says, Sierra Waters is sexy as hell. You can find out more about The Plot to Save Socrates by Paul Levinson at theplottosavesocrates.com. Paul Levinson spilled code about an ancient biotech war raging on in secret for centuries. 